May 2001, the Imperial War Museum, London. The 60th anniversary of the great British naval victory, the sinking of the Bismarck. This World War II naval battle has become legendary. The greatest warship afloat sunk on only the ninth day of her maiden voyage. But behind the myth is a story of epic bravery and blunder. The outcome could have been so very different. Triumph was very nearly disaster. The last of these actual pictures of the battle shows the Bismarck a smoking ruin. And over the whole affair hangs a question no one has yet answered. Did the British really sink the Bismarck? Amazingly, some German survivors claimed they sank their own ship. In the summer of 2001, an international expedition steamed far out into the North Atlantic to find and film the last resting place of one of the most famous warships of all time and to probe the mystery of who sank the Bismarck. The voyage was part of a hugely ambitious project. Expedition leader David Mearns is a world authority on deep ocean exploration. He became the first person to rediscover Bismarck's victim, HMS Hood. Hood had lain at the bottom of the Denmark Strait between Greenland and Iceland for 60 years. For the first time in history, the team located and filmed the wreck and solved many of the mysteries surrounding her sinking. But Hood lies on a flat underwater plane. Finding and filming Bismarck is an altogether different proposition, despite the fact she's been found before. Bismarck was discovered by American explorer Bob Ballard in 1989, when underwater video technology was relatively primitive. The images of her were unclear, and the survey of the wreck incomplete. It also took over two years to find her, and her location was kept secret. David Mearns has since researched all the reported positions for Bismarck sinking and has come up with a search area of 100 square miles, which he has divided into a series of lines. Locating Bismarck again will be hard. She is three miles down in one of the deepest abysses of the North Atlantic. However, the previous expedition left a vital clue. Bismarck is said to lie on the deeply ravine side of an underwater volcano. There is only one such geological feature within the area. David is confident of finding Bismarck on the first line through the search box. Well, I'm going to sit down later, actually, and, and work through my, my line strategy, and I'll have a better feel then. But I, I, I do think we're going to find it... Um, earlier rather than later and some of that is is just going to be a bit of skill but also uh, a bit of luck as well the key to finding the wreck will be one of the most advanced underwater sonar units in the world it operates at huge depths scouring up and down the ocean floor with sound waves to create a detailed map of the area David will then send down the ROV. This remote-controlled submersible will deliver the highest quality video pictures of Bismarck and they will be used to conduct the first ever comprehensive survey of the wreck. If Bismarck is found, then historian Dr. Eric Grove, an underwater forensic expert, Bill Durans, will help David assess whether the Bismarck was, in fact, sunk by British torpedoes or scuttled by her own crew. 
our inspection of the damage, as far as we can see it along the sides of the ship, should shed some light on how much water she was taking in before the Germans claimed that they opened the seacocks and perhaps even exploded scuttling charges. The idea of the scuttling charges is, is, is controversial. There's uh, uh, some anecdotal evidence from survivors that scuttling charges were installed. I think actually it fits the German naval mindset. And better uh, to take the ship, no, to, to sink the ship yourself rather than even, even to risk it falling into enemy hands. But as the research vessel Northern Horizon reaches the search area, the weather threatens to undo David's carefully laid plans. But the whole North Atlantic right now is, uh, is a mess. It's not a place to be. We're ready to go. We're just sort of sitting here holding fire. A Force 10 gale blows up. The team keep their delicate equipment tied to the heaving deck. The expedition costs tens of thousands of dollars a day. Time is a precious commodity. David's plan to find Bismarck fast is already three days behind schedule. The battleship Bismarck was a legend from the day she was launched in 1939. Adored by Hitler, Bismarck was a towering symbol of the technological supremacy of the Third Reich. She was designed to be indestructible and very fast. She was built in secret in Hamburg. At 820 feet long, she was Germany's biggest warship. She was also bristling with eight 15-inch guns. She had 13-inch thick steel armor and a top speed of 30 knots. Bismarck was the quickest and best armored ship of her day. Even as she lay in harbor, she was a drain on the British Navy, who had to cover her every possible move. Let loose in the Atlantic, she will be a lethal threat to the merchant convoy ships supplying Britain. But despite the formidable credentials of his new ship, Bismarck's new commander was not happy. German Admiral Gunther Lütjens was an Atlantic veteran. On a two-month mission in early 1941, leading the battleship Scharnhorst and Neisenau, Admiral Lütjen sank 116,000 tons of British merchant shipping. Despite being outnumbered 10 to 1, the German Navy was winning the war at sea. Their strategy was to avoid clashes with warships and instead attack the merchant convoys. Hitler's plan was to starve Britain into submission. But it's not clear that Admiral Lutyens had much faith in his Führer's strategy. The broadcaster Ludovic Kennedy, who took part as a young officer in the action against the Bismarck, believes Admiral Lutyens was at odds with Hitler and Nazism. When Hitler inspected the Bismarck at Gottenhafen, Admiral Lutyens had the officers arranged on the quarterdeck to uh, receive him, and all the junior officers went like that. But Lutyens gave the old naval salute like that. He wasn't going to kowtow to Nazism. In fact, Lutyens' own grandmother was Jewish. Gerhard Lutyens was 10 years old when his father left to take up command of the Bismarck. There were many Jewish officers in the Navy, a great many, older ones too, who had fought in the First World War. And they were protected. Or well, some had wives that were Jewish or that sort of thing. Well, you know how the Nazis were completely crazy. But apparently it was possible to be a Jewish officer in the Navy, and many of them were saved. 
Admiral Luchin's own brother had fled to Switzerland at the start of the war. Luchin's loyalty to the Navy had made him stay, but from the start, he had serious doubts. The armed forces hadn't really realized the war was a total waste of time. Of course, we realized it later. But very early on, my father knew. He had said that we would probably never be able to win this war. He said, we haven't got enough oil and it won't work. But that was the way it was. He was a military man and he, he did his duty. In this film taken by the propaganda ministry, Luchens is seen coming on board to meet the crew as they prepared for their maiden voyage. On the 18th of May, 1941, after five years of building and preparation, the awesome Bismarck slipped out of the Baltic, her mission to decimate the Atlantic convoys. But Luchin's new success would depend on how long the ships could remain undetected. Many younger officers, like gunnery officer Baron von Mullenheim Reckberg, doubted it was possible. He is now 90 years old. In 1936, he was German naval attaché to Great Britain, based in Berkeley Square. Then he served as Admiral Luchin's adjutant before being posted to the Bismarck as third gunnery officer. After the war, working as a diplomat, he found out that Bismarck had been spotted almost immediately after her departure. There was an ornithologist, Edward K. Bath, off the south coast of Norway. He was part of the Norwegian underground. He photographed anything of interest that he saw. So on that particular day, he took a photo of the Bismarck and then the Prince Eugen. It is of great historical interest because it shows that we had been spotted several times. So much for remaining undetected. Admiral Luchin's preferred route into the Atlantic was north of Iceland through the Arctic. The propaganda film shows the ships entering the ice flows but unknown to the Germans. The Denmark Strait between Greenland and Iceland had been staked out by two British cruisers, HMS Norfolk and Suffolk. They started to shadow the German ships. Initially, we had hoped to be able to shake Suffolk off. We tried changing course, heading for patches of fog and so on. Nothing worked. They kept on shadowing us. The British cruisers sent out the alert. Lurking just off the south coast of Iceland, ready to pounce, were the massive HMS Hood and the brand new battleship Prince of Wales. The Germans had been ambushed. Bismarck's crew leapt into action. The state-of-the-art gunnery swiftly sank the hood and left the Prince of Wales badly damaged. But as the German gunnery crews cheered, Luchens was already a very worried man. With his attackers in disarray, Luchens made for the vast expanse of the Atlantic. But he still couldn't shake off the cruisers Suffolk and Norfolk. They stuck to Bismarck and Prince Eugen like glue. Luchin suspected that the British cruisers could be using a new long-range radar system that far outperformed the Germans' own. For a huge surface ship like Bismarck in hostile waters, that would be disaster. For Luchin's, his mission was over just as it was starting. He was sure he couldn't hide and he soon found out he couldn't run. Bismarck had been hit by the Prince of Wales below the waterline. She was losing oil. Her speed was down. She had to get back to a safe port. The nearest was over a thousand miles away. On board the research vessel Northern Horizon, there is good news. A weather window has opened up hopefully long enough to complete the mission. 
After days of waiting, expedition leader David Mearns can launch the sonar unit. It will travel 15,000 feet down into the deep ocean to hunt for Bismarck. David is hopeful he will find the wreck on his first sonar pass through the search box. Yeah, it's a, just, you know, sort of three days of frustration is now released and now it's, you know, the excitement will build once we get on, uh, online. When the sonar is a thousand feet from the seabed, the ship tows it, using satellite navigation on a perfectly straight line through the search area. The line is 12 miles long. With the ship moving at two miles an hour, the first pass goes on well into the night. Um, I mean, this is all the sort of telltale signs that you're in the, in the middle of a, of a debris field and there's some unusual, I mean, these are not sort of usual patterns. Well, we'll see what happens here, but that's, <laughs> I have a feeling that. There are some hints of smaller debris, but strangely no sign of the massive hull. The ship turns round to make another pass through the search box. Will Bismarck this be in it. there? This is the debris field. So Six the hours later, well. something begins to appear on the monitor. The that. There's a shadow behind that. Here it comes. That's it. 236 meters, that's it. <laughs> there you go. Well done. <laughs> Fantastic. Nice run. Yeah. Just another day in the park, isn't it? <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> right, well done. That's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thanks. David has indeed located the main hull of Bismarck quickly, in less than 24 hours. But it will be another 24 hours before David can confirm his discovery by sending down the ROV, the eyes of the expedition. The day after Bismarck destroyed HMS Hood was Sunday the 25th of May, 1941. It was also Admiral Gunter Lutjen's 52nd birthday. He received birthday greetings from the Führer himself. He and his ship were commended by Hitler on the dramatic sinking of the Hood. And Lutjens had also just pulled off a tactical masterstroke. The previous day, the cruisers HMS Suffolk and Norfolk and the limping Prince of Wales continue to track Bismarck and Prince Eugen south. Closing in from the east was Commander-in-Chief of the British Home Fleet, Admiral Sir John Tovey. On board the battleship HMS King George V, he was steaming at high speed along with HMS Repulse and the aircraft carrier Victorious. Convoy escorts HMS Rodney and Dorsetshire were diverted to the chase. At midnight, Tovey ordered a torpedo attack by the aircraft from HMS Victorious. But they failed to inflict any damage on Bismarck. Then, in an audacious move at night, Admiral Luchens had his ship separate. Bismarck doubled back into a rain squall and then headed east, while Prince Eugen veered southwest. In the confusion, the new experimental British radar lost both German ships. Bismarck had slipped her pursuers and was alone in the vast expanse of the North Atlantic. Luchens was in the clear. His intelligence sources intercepted British radio traffic. They reported the British had lost Bismarck. Luchens didn't believe them. He felt sure British radar must be plotting his every move. He broadcast a long, rambling message to Shaw, asking for U-boat and air support. 
it was a fatal mistake. The transmission was immediately intercepted by the British and the now distant Prince Eugen. We threw up our hands in despair and thought to ourselves, good heavens. The tracking ships must have lost contact with their target. There are no radio messages from them. And now the Bismarck is sending such a long radio message, which will undoubtedly enable the enemy to locate her position. By intercepting the transmission from Bismarck at various radio stations on land, the Admiralty in London were able to get a rough directional fix on Bismarck's position. It seemed to them she was heading east to German-occupied France. But the data was inconclusive. They decided Admiral Tovey had a better view of the situation. They sent him the raw data to make his own calculations and draw his own conclusions. Unfortunately, on board HMS King George V, Tovey's staff got their calculations back to front. Instead of heading east in pursuit, they turned north, believing she was heading back to Norway. Instead of closing in on their prey, the British were now steaming at top speed in the wrong direction. Back in London, the Admiralty were confused by the fact that the British ships pursuing Bismarck had turned north. They thought Tovey must know something they didn't. But their calculations still showed Bismarck heading east to a port in northern France. To make sure, RAF Coastal Command was asked to sweep over the easterly route. The Admiralty's hunch was right. Bismarck was found again. Unfortunately, she was now 150 miles east of the fleet. Tovey's ships would never catch her. Somehow, the German ship had to be slowed down. The northern horizon is on the very spot where Bismarck sank 60 years ago. Expedition leader David Mearns watches anxiously as his team prepare the ROV, the remote-controlled submersible. It will descend to the very bottom of the ocean. From there, it will feed back high-quality images of the hull, the great ship, and all the debris that fell off as she sank. With four days already lost and the weather outlook uncertain, David wants to start filming Bismarck quickly. Six hours later, at one in the morning, the ROV reaches the ocean floor. And the team gather in the control room, anxious to confirm whether they really have found the Bismarck. Ah, uh, those are boots. Yes, those are boots, definitely. The ROV has dropped down right on top of the mass of debris. The plan is to progress through it and hopefully locate the main hull of the ship. Only then can the team search its exterior for the signs of the torpedo damage that the British claim sank Bismarck. Or will they find evidence that the Germans scuttled their own ship? As the ROV proceeds forward through the field of debris, it comes across larger and larger pieces. This is part of the range-finding apparatus used to aim the main guns. Then into shot comes a huge piece of debris. My God! Is that the bottom of the... Oh. It looks yeah, the, bo bo the bottom of the turret. No, no. Is that a turret inverted? Whatever it is, it's upside down. This is indeed one of Bismarck's 1,000-ton gun turrets. As the ship rolled, it would have fallen out and now lies upside down on the seabed. Visible in the center of picture is an open escape hatch. Then the team discovers the very heart of the ship. 
The superstructure is the main tower of the ship containing the bridge. On this very platform behind these windows stood Captain Lindemann and Admiral Lutyens. Now it lies upside down, having snapped off as one complete piece as the ship sank. But after exploring the field of debris, the team start to draw a blank. The main hull doesn't seem to be in the same area. The search goes on all night and into the next day. This is a challenging terrain, an underwater mountain range rivaling the Alps in size. The team are having to negotiate the deep ravines on the side of the underwater volcano. The ridges along the tops of the ravines are limiting their view. This must be part of the problem in that they're getting shielded from targets. We're on the wrong side of a ridge and they can't see over it. That's the only way to explain this. Do we need to move the uh, well, we'll see if you can. I mean, there's no other way yeah. to explain him not being able to see anything. You know, he's been, they've been down there for hours and they haven't had a target. The hull could so easily be just beyond the next hill. Hello, ROV. This is uh, Sonar. By seven in the evening, even David's apparently limitless patience is wearing thin. Hello, ROV hut. What? I had enough of this sh I get ready to pay our kid. And then, when it seems things couldn't get more frustrating, the ROV stops moving. It was that oil that came up on the camera lens? No, it's just dust. I think we're probably looking at the full recovery. The way she's responding, it looks like a hydraulic line may have gone or the pump was shagged for some reason. Well, I think this dive is over. Yet again, David is looking at a schedule that is slipping away from him. As the ROV is recovered, it soon becomes clear that it has blown a hydraulic line. Good. Look at the damage. Huh? Okay, pull out the light. Luckily, the damage is not critical. The problem can be fixed, but the delay only adds to the tension. Three miles below them, Bismarck waits to give up the secrets of her sinking. Sixty years ago, the race was on as Bismarck tried to dash to safety and it looked like she was going to make it, as one by one the British ships chasing her ran out of fuel and had to turn back. Eventually, only Admiral Tovey's own ship, HMS King George V, and the cruiser Norfolk were left. But they were still over 150 miles behind Bismarck. The convoy escorts, HMS Rodney and Dorsetshire, which had been diverted to the chase, were also too far away. Tovey's only hope lay with the ships from the Force H, the British Mediterranean fleet, which had been sent up from Gibraltar the previous day. They included the cruiser HMS Sheffield and the aircraft carrier HMS Ark Royal. She carried a squadron of swordfish bombers. Despite their antiquated appearance, these canvas and wire biplanes were a pioneering design. And they were still the only aircraft that could haul a torpedo off the ship's deck. As a last-ditch effort, they were ordered to attack. The hope was they could slow Bismarck down, but the weather off the Spanish coast was abysmal. The, uh, the Ark Royal attack was absolutely astonishing because they would never normally, if it was a, if it was a practice shoot, practice uh, attack, they would have never taken off. I mean, they measured the, uh, the amount the stern was rising and falling in this tremendous sea, 
and it was something like 55 feet going up and down like that. Like many young wartime pilots, Ken Pattison had married shortly before he was sent on active duty. At the age of 24, he found himself sitting on the deck of Ark Royal in a storm, waiting to take on the most powerful German warship afloat. I can remember, you know, sitting on the deck with the aircraft running, waiting to take off. I can remember feeling my wedding ring under my glove and thinking, I hope that I shall get back. Almost saying a little prayer. I'm not that religious, but one gets that feeling, you know. Fifteen swordfish headed off on a stormy 300-mile round trip to find the German warship. When we were briefed, we were told, there's one ship out there, the Bismarck, go and sink her. <laughs> but um, they didn't tell us the Sheffield was halfway between the Art Royal and the Bismarck. And in the cloud and the, the hype set conditions, the poor old leader of the flight saw this ship and said, oh, well, it must be the Bismarck. There's no other ship there. And so down we went. In fact, Ark Royal had been told that the British cruiser HMS Sheffield was now shadowing the Bismarck. Unfortunately, the message was still sitting unread in the air squadron's in-tray. The swordfish went in to attack their own ship. Luckily, disaster was avoided. A new type of detonator had been fitted to the torpedoes. They all failed to explode. None of this was doing Admiral Tovey's blood pressure any good. Unless Bismarck's speed was reduced by midnight, his ships would have to turn home for lack of fuel. He immediately ordered the swordfish of Force H to launch another attack. This time, the torpedoes were fitted with the old detonators. Well, they rearmed and refueled the aircraft. We had a bite to eat, because it was late afternoon this, this time. And uh, then we took off again. With the gale still raging, the second attack took off. With it was pilot John Moffat. I couldn't believe what I was feeling. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And it still haunts me. It's uh, a terrifying sight, terrifying. It's unbelievable, it's just like hail coming at you, uh, you know, with these tracers. We came out of the cloud, went right down onto the water, 90 feet, 90 knots. You had to slow down because we were doing 180 knots in the dive. We had to slow down because it was no good dropping the torpedo too fast because they are almost a little bit delicate and they would break up so and there's no good dropping them at 800 feet either you've got to get right down on the water she was firing her main armament into the sea ahead of us and you'd suddenly see great columns of spray going up this voice in, the, in my ears and, and this was my observer my navigator and he was telling me I'll tell you I'll tell you and I thought well I couldn't understand what he was on about you see and I said what, what you, what's it about and his name was Miller and I said what's wrong Miller and, and he says I, I'll tell you when to let it go and I thought good lord you know and, I, and I, next thing I had just looked out the side of the aircraft and there he was hanging over the side. Yeah, I'm not kidding, I mean hanging over the side. 
and there he was leaning right out and his head down and then and he kept, he kept saying not yet not yet and then I realized what he was on the idea is you see the sea was so bad as you can imagine these waves that if you didn't set that torpedo into the trough properly in the uh, if you hit the top of a wave and it porpoised it, it's of no use it wouldn't run he had to get it so it went straight in and he held me there he held me far too long it was, only, it was a, few, a few seconds but it felt like years but uh, and then he just uh, said let her go you know he said, okay and I just pressed it in and, and the next thing I heard him shout was we've got a runner <laughs> As I went in on my attack and got down, I realized she was turning to port. So I aimed well off across ahead of her bow, dropped my fish, and then I got out of it as quick as I could. Amazingly, Every single aircraft returned to the Ark Royal with little more than minor damage. But to the pilots, it seemed that their attack on Bismarck had failed. To Admiral Tovey, the situation now looked desperate. He had only a few hours' worth of fuel left. Quiet resignation started to set in. Despite the huge efforts by the Royal Navy, it seemed Bismarck would slip the net. Then, slowly, dismay gave way to disbelief. The Sheffield shadowing sent a signal to Tavi saying, course of Bismarck due north. Well, the course that Bismarck had been steering was roughly south-east towards Brest or saint Nazaire. Tuffy said to his officers on the plot, I fear poor Larkham, that was the name of the captain of the Sheffield, has joined the reciprocal club, meaning that uh, he, he had thought the Bismarck was going from right to left, when in fact she was going from left to right, or the other way around, uh, which is an easy mistake to be made by an inexperienced officer. But uh, the officers thought uh, poor old Larkham to make such a balls up at this time. We didn't know at that time that we'd hit her rudder, they couldn't understand why she was turning. They thought she was in a kind of turn to p avoid torpedoes. And then the swordfish who was shadowing also reported the ship heading north. And they knew then that she was in trouble. In an ocean now swept by radar and policed by aircraft, battleships could no longer hide. So we basically drifted towards our executioner. That was the worst part of the whole operation, the certainty that we were powerless to escape our fate. After hurried repairs, the remotely operated vehicle, the ROV, is ready to go back in the water to resume its search for the elusive hull. This time it also carries a bronze plaque in memory of the sailors of Bismarck. Yeah, if we take a closer look, if there's a, if there's a really good landing zone, then that's fine. David had wanted to lay the plaque on the bow of the Bismarck. With the main hull of the ship proving elusive and the fears that the weather might again turn against him, David decides to compromise. Nothing, drop it, drop it. Good. Well done, well done. Perfect. Okay. The plaque is placed on the biggest part of debris already found, on the superstructure near Admiral Luchin's bridge. Then, soon after, the team locate what seems to be a huge trench dug out of the mountainside by Bismarck.
the sinking hull of Bismarck hit the seabed at around 24 miles an hour. It blasted an impact crater over a mile wide into the rocky surface. But because it hit the steep slopes of an extinct underwater volcano, it started to slide. Bismarck's huge 50,000-ton heavily armored hull charged down the slope, ripping out a deep trench nearly two miles long. The ROV is now in that trench and heading downhill. The road to the wreck is staring us dead in the face. Yeah, Roger right that, Dave. We're steady, so we're good. Okay, thank you. What's that, R.D.? What the hell is that? What's that in front of you? That is exactly what we've been looking for. That's a... Uh... That's Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, there, look at that. Yes. Yes. Right. Sir. Yes. Oh, yeah. I was going ready to go in there. What's wrong with you guys? They're strong. Oh, yes. They're strong. Fantastic. Well done. <laughs> The clarity of the water at 15,000 feet is breathtaking. The images of the massive ship are better than anyone had dared hope for. At last, a scientific analysis of the wreck can shed light on the historical accounts of this famous battle. As the dawn came up on the morning of Tuesday the 27th of May, the British ship started to circle Bismarck. At 0847, they opened fire. The big battleships, HMS King George V and HMS Rodney, along with the cruisers Dorsetshire and Norfolk, launched salvo after salvo. Bismarck, unable to steer, wandered aimlessly through a firestorm. the shells start landing, and they land in very large numbers indeed. They convert the upper part of the ship into a wreck very rapidly. They kill hundreds of, hundreds of members of the crew. They penetrate inside the armor on the upper works, and although they don't destroy the ship's capacity to float, they destroy the ship's capacity to fight. Within a very few minutes, one of the finest battleships in the world is converted into a useless burning wreck. This is the control tower where Mullenheim Reckberg sat. The range-finding apparatus, which should sit on top, is completely missing. At that moment, we received a hit and the entire viewing equipment was blasted away. The rangefinder had been destroyed. The operators were dead. We were thrown against the side and got a bloody nose. That was my only injury during the entire incident. Bismarck's secondary guns were all eliminated. Each shows evidence of direct hits. Bismarck's single remaining gun the rear turret was obliterated by a 16-inch shell at 9.31 a.m. Bismarck's guns fell silent. Virtually everyone who was on the deck of Bismarck died. Most of the survivors were men like engineers who worked below decks. The main witnesses to the horrors above decks were the British onlookers. I saw it all. They were giving the ship a most awful pounding. Can't imagine what it must have been like on board. The scenes of carnage 
on board after the battle started were really horrific. Men, friends next to them, being hit by a splinter and uh, ripping their stomachs open and all the guts coming out and bone and blood and all that. I mean, really horrific things. And I think that's, I mean, that, that you don't expect in the course of a lifetime. It still haunts me. Because these poor souls, they just got no chance. None. <laughs> the British Admiral, Tovey, was low on fuel and there were reports of imminent German air and U-boat attacks. At 10.21 a.m., he broke off the engagement and headed for home, ordering HMS Dorsetshire to torpedo the Bismarck. Leaving the battle whilst Bismarck was still afloat, both puzzled and angered the Admiralty. But the evidence of the expedition now suggests Tubby's decision was not so strange. It's clear from a detailed examination of the hull that the handful of torpedoes the British had already fired had had a much greater effect than previously believed. Earlier in the action, HMS Rodney and Norfolk had fired four torpedoes each at Bismarck's starboard side. The survey of the hull revealed at least four out of the eight hit. One tore open Bismarck's weaker underbelly and prized apart these 13-inch thick side armor plates. The resulting flooding would have been devastating. Tuffy may well have seen that Bismarck was going to sink. We now think that a torpedo from Dorsetshire came in about here and actually exploded on the main deck here. Causing huge damage, of course, because of the size of the warhead. Below the waterline, when one takes torpedo hits, the flooding is uh, restricted by Contained. compartmentation. Uh, up above, in the main deck, and what we call, in, in the U.S. Navy at least, the second deck area, uh, that's all more or less wide open. And once water gets in there, it floods through, freely throughout the ship. So once a ship gets to that point, she doesn't come back. The conclusion of the expedition is that Bismarck was indeed sunk by British torpedoes. If the Germans did open the Seacocks to scuttle Bismarck as some anecdotal evidence from survivors claimed, it only hastened the inevitable. Towards the end of the action, the swordfish from Ark Royal had hoped to finish off the Bismarck. But the planes from the Mediterranean-based force were not welcomed by the home fleet. Bismarck was their prize. Revenge for sinking the hood. The planes were fired on by ships of their own side. I think it was the Dorsetshire who gave us a broadside when we were about to attack. That's probably because of the fact that we were, we were a different force in wrong waters. We understood that when we got back because that was revenge for the hood. As the planes flew away at 10.38, Bismarck started to roll over. The men from below decks now tried to escape. Otto Peters was in the engine rooms of Bismarck that night. Wirklich. And well, it was then that we finally knew that we really did have to leave the ship. And there were mountains of dead bodies. It was a horrifying sight. There were hundreds of dead bodies and the ship had almost sunk by the time I reached the upper deck. The waves were crashing overhead and it's really terrible to see people with the blood all washed out of them and only their flesh remaining. Bismarck had a crew of two and a half thousand men. 800 men got away as she sank. This photograph taken from the Dorsetshire shows the survivors swimming towards the British ship. Dorsetshire and the destroyer Maori moved in to rescue the German sailors.
not shortly after the ships came to a halt, there was a warning of a U-boat attack. I was utterly horrified when all of a sudden we set off again and I realized that the others were not going to be rescued. Although I was unaware of it at the time, I had been one of the last to be rescued. All warships were under strict orders to move off. To be static in the water near a submarine was considered suicidal. It, it was awful. And that same feeling of compassion, which the Germans had found when they saw the hood disappear, were replicated by uh, us in the British ships. It uh, was just the same sort of feelings the Germans had. It's this thing of the comradeship of the sea. It's a... Uh, it's a very instinctive thing. Of the 800 German sailors who had survived the shelling, nearly 700 were left in the water. No one knows how Admiral Lutyen's met his death. Yeah, my, father had... my father always had his gold watch with him, a pocket watch with a spring lid. But this time he had left it behind, saying that it was to be given to me should he not return. Those were the last words I heard him say. One morning my mother came in and told me that my father was dead and that I didn't have to go to school. That was that. Winston Churchill was in the House of Commons at the time, and somebody handed him a piece of paper, and he said, I've just received news uh, that the Bismarck had been sunk. And everybody cheered, except for one man, that was Harold Nicholson, the writer, who was a member of Parliament. And he, more than most, sensed the human tragedy and the loss of so many lives. 4,000 sailors on the two sides, including two admirals, died. 112 Bismarck survivors were landed at Newcastle and spent the rest of the war in camps in Canada. Today, many of those who remain meet at the memorial to their lost shipmates in the Bismarck family estate near Hamburg. With them are some of the men who sank them. Together, both sides still remember the 4,000 men of Hood and Bismarck who died. Although they didn't realize it at the time, these men took part in one of the last chapters of the battleship era. Such huge gunships were never built again. The Battle of the Hood and Bismarck proved that even the most powerful weapons either side possessed could now be destroyed by something smaller, cheaper, and more mobile. Soon aircraft would come to dominate naval warfare. This expedition has reopened that chapter of history and found new answers to unsolved mysteries. The men who served and died in Hood and Bismarck have not been forgotten. The world has been able to gaze once more upon the ships that rule the waves in the age of the battleship.